Thank you so much. Thank you. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> All right, well, welcome. All right, who here sells something? Okay. Who here hates selling things? <laughs> okay. Well, that's very, very common, and we're going to talk about ways that we can kind of get over that hump. And it may, you may not love selling, but we're going to try to make it a lot less unpleasant. Okay, so what is scarier than heights? Spiders. Spiders, okay. <laughs> what's, what's scarier than spiders? <laughs> okay, so it's been said that public, the fear of public speaking is greater than the fear of dying, right? What's scarier than this? It's the fear of rejection, right? I know we're all big grown-ups. And um, we think that we're over that, but honestly, there's a lot of us that we still find that we resist or back away from um, what our true potential is because we're, fear, we're afraid of someone hurting our feelings, okay? Um, and what do I know about a fear of sales or about a fear of rejection? So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been selling since I was five years old. Both of my parents were real estate agents, and they used to practice their listing presentations with me. And I got so good at doing them that their broker brought me in to do sales training when I was five. He said, if a five-year-old can do a perfect listing presentation, so can you. I didn't know at the time he was shaming them, but I just thought it was me being awesome, right? Did you get a stupid speech? <laughs> I did. They did give me ice cream. I think that counts. So... Um, so a couple of years later, when I was in fourth grade, my parents got divorced, and I became a raging people pleaser. And what is the one thing people pleasers fear more than anything else? Disappointing, Disappointing someone. No. Hearing the word no, because that means I haven't met an expectation, right? So how did I reconcile my love of sales with my fear of rejection? Well, I learned that it's not about me, okay? And it's not about you. So rejection is just a part of the sales process. In fact, if you're not getting rejected, you're not selling enough, okay? Think about that for a second. All right, so here's some numbers to maybe help get you a little bit more comfortable with that rejection. 80% of consumers say no the first four times a salesperson talks to them. Not the first four times a crappy salesperson talks to them. Any salesperson, the best salesperson in the world gets told no, okay? This is, has nothing to do with your self-worth. It has nothing to do with your ability to sell if you're hearing no, okay? It takes five calls to get a yes on average if you're calling, right? Not for the worst salesperson in the world. That's the average salesperson, five calls. 72% of cold calls end in rejection, okay? It's not you, this is, just the, this is just the game. The game is about collecting no's. Now, when you've gone through the 80%, the five calls, the 72% of cold calls that end in rejection, and you're still not getting a yes, one of the reasons might be it's not about you and you're making it about you, okay? The number one reason for rejection is you're presenting your agenda and not solving a problem for the client. So, how do you achieve inner sales nirvana? Huh? Well, first you have to get your mind right, okay? It's all in your head. All your fear, all the projections that you have about other people, all your inner insecurities that you fear most about yourself that you're placing on other people, that's all in your head. How many times, raise your hand, if you've gone to call somebody or make a connection and you've said, I don't really want to bother them? 
thank you for telling the truth. <laughs> right? How do you know? Right? Or, no matter what time of day it is, well, it's 9.30, they probably just got to the office. Well, it's 10.30, they're probably winding down for lunch. Well, it's 1.30, they probably just got back from lunch. There's no good time of the day to call and bother somebody, right? But you don't know because you're attempting to read their minds. How many psychics are in here? Me. I was a psychic for two days. That's another story for another day. But at, even at then, I can't tell what somebody is thinking about when I go to call them, right? I don't know. I'm trying to read their minds. When you go to call someone, one of the most powerful things you can do is operate non-judgmental self-observation. Have you ever done this? What this is, is that you just listen without judgment to yourself, to your own self-talk and behavior, and just observe it, okay? You go to call somebody or email somebody and you just observe your body behavior and what you're saying to yourself. And if you say, or you start saying negative things to yourself, just observe it and go, that's interesting that I do that. Don't judge it, just remark it. Write it down and move on. Because what'll start happening is you'll start saying, you'll start changing because you'll start realizing that you're sabotaging yourself. Just listen to yourself talk. Don't beat yourself up, but just observe it. Now, are you playing credit manager? Does anybody in here know what this means? Yeah. Do you play credit manager? So I learned this, this is very powerful. I learned this from uh, an old sales manager of mine. I was selling pools. I've sold everything. I've sold alarms, pools, life insurance, uh, booze, some things we can't say in mixed company. I have sold just about everything. But I was selling pools this one time and I went up to this house, it was a ramshackle house, and the guy uh, was walking around in his front yard. He was picking up some stuff out of the yard. He had overalls, no shirt. I can't remember if he had shoes on or not, but for this story, we're going to say no. And I called my manager. I said, um, he sent me to the wrong place. This guy does not have enough money to buy $5,000. And it was above, above ground pools. And he said, how do you know? I was like, I know. And he's like, no, you're playing credit manager, and that's not your job. <laughs> okay. He said, in fact, I've been on the phone with this guy, and this guy's not buying a pool. This guy's got a young wife. He's buying seeing his wife in a bikini for the rest of the summer. Now go in there and give that man what he wants. Okay? Right? Because I was playing credit manager. I almost taught myself out of a deal. Are you thinking about more uh, what's in it for you than it's what's in it for the client? Nobody has ever sat out in their car before going in to do a sales conversation with somebody sweating bullets because they were afraid they couldn't solve someone's problem. Okay? When you're feeling that anxiety and when you're feeling that fear and you're feeling that resistance to go and have a sales conversation, it's not because you don't have the solution that they've been looking for. It's because you're focusing on what you need to get out of it. But if you put that aside, and it takes practice, but if you can put that aside, then you can go in and really focus on the other person with power. Are you having enough sales conversations? Right? Are you doing this enough that you're comfortable or are you doing it just enough to survive? Okay. Repetition. Do you think the person at the drive-thru at McDonald's when they upsell you on your fries, do you think they have sales fear? No. <laughs> no. Why? Because they do it 700 times a day. Do you want fries with that? Do you want fries with that? Do you want fries with that? Right? So if you make more chances to interact with clients, you have more chances to um, have more closing conversations, even if you know it's not going to go anywhere. You're exercising that muscle and you can gain comfort and repetition.
okay? Anybody like McDonald's fries? Wait till you see this. Okay, all that selling that you hate, that's not your job. Okay, your job is to provide solutions to problems. Hopefully not problems this guy's solving, right? Okay. What makes really easy to get really good at solving problems is defining who you're solving problems for. Okay? It's not everybody in the known universe. And the more you can get clear about who your target market is, the easier it's going to be for you to solve their problems. And the more power you're going to have behind you and in your heart when you know that you can solve a problem for somebody because you've done it. Yes? Absolutely. I'm gonna, we're going to have a robust question and answer session at the end. Okay. So they don't need a salesman or a saleswoman. They need a trusted guide. They need a trusted advisor to walk with them and give them advice. Now, is there a difference between selling a website and being a trusted advisor? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. What you can't do is sell websites and be a trusted advisor. And, I mean, you can obviously make a sale, and that's the point. But you can't go in with my, if my job is to go in and sell you on a website, that's not going to elevate the conversation the way that I come in to find a solution for what you need, right? Those are different conversations. Okay, let me make sure, this is a new cl clicker for me. Okay, so start to get to know them. As their trusted advisor, what do they need? Where's their pain point, right? What, what's really keeping them up at night? And if you can start a conversation from really what's important to them, then you can get a lot further. Um, and, and start... I want to tell you about my biggest referral partner I have. So my biggest referral partner has sent me a lot of work over the years. And he has a lot of business, and everybody knows that he's got a lot of work. Okay? And people have been coming at him for years trying to get his business. Okay? And they come at him with, I want to get some of those referrals. But when I met him, I said, what's your biggest pain point? And he said, I hate content. And I said, in my head, me too, right? But I can do content. And I said, why don't you let me take that off your hands? And so I started doing a little trust building with him. And then one day he said, you know, I've got all these referrals I could send you, right? Because it wasn't about me. It was about solving his problem. Find out what they like about folks they don't buy from. Okay. If you don't know where to start a sales conversation, ask them about who they've done business with in the past. Was there something you didn't like from the people you didn't do business with? I went uh, to talk to this gentleman, and all he could talk about was all the people he had already met with about this project. He had met with six other web agencies, and he hated them all. And I said, well, what was the commonality? What did you not like about them? He said, they don't know how to hustle and they don't know how to communicate. OK, well, that's interesting. And I said, well, have you ever done business with anybody you did like? Because he was kind of cranky and that was questionable. And he said, yes, dozens. I said, what was the commonality? What did you like about them? And he said, they knew how to hustle and they knew how to communicate. What do you think I talked about for the next 20 minutes? Hustling and communicating. And that's what I was selling him because he wasn't buying a website. He was buying hustle and communication, right? 
So you listen what they say when they get agitated. If you walk into a conversation and it's there are just irate, okay, that could be a red flag. But that could be an opportunity to recover a really great project. And then you can talk their language to them, bending your story to their concerns. And be ready with a solution to their problem that they just told you about, right? Not the website, the solution to their pain, or not the logo, or the branding, or the content, right? You want to solve their problem. So a lot of uh, bad feelings, negative feelings about sales comes from our own experience with salespeople. Okay, who's had a really bad experience with a salesperson? Today. <laughs> Yesterday, right? Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take some of these old tried and true classic sales techniques and we want to update them uh, for the digital age. And we want to do it with a little bit more style than these jokers have been doing. Okay. Anybody ever seen a going out of business sign? Right? Has anybody ever seen that furniture store that's been going out of business for the last three years? Yeah, we all, we all know that guy, right? All right, so updated for the digital age. Urgency. Because that's really what that's about, urgency and scarcity. So one of the ways that I use urgency and scarcity is I'm booking up quickly. I can only take on two more projects and I'd love one of those to be yours. Okay. Anybody remember, and this might be dating myself a little bit, anybody remember when you were kids and a salesman would come to the door, your mom would open the door and he'd stick his foot in? Right? That was back in the day. Foot in the door, because you can't close the door, right? Updated for the digital age, tripwire product. Because all you want to do is get them in the door, right? Build some trust, build some um, communication. So maybe you can't, maybe you can sell them your big enchilada the first first time, but maybe you just need to sell them a bite. Here's one. What about now? Now? <laughs> what about now? <laughs> Updated for the digital age. Continuing to demonstrate your prospect's value, okay? Maybe this is not, hey, did you see that proposal? Maybe this is, hey, I saw this and I thought of you. Which one is building relationships and making it about the client and which one's making it about you, right? So if we all, if we continually turn the frame away from us and back onto the client, we can, we can just solve almost every situation we have. Anybody ever heard this one? He who talks first loses, okay? What this means is in a sales conversation, eventually there's gonna become an awkward question. Usually it's around money, time, position, terms. And you're going to want to fill the silence that follows with anything. Because in that silence, we project our own insecurities. We try to read their mind. We try to play credit manager. In that silence, though, is where the money is. Okay. And he who talks first loses. Okay, If you talk first, you're going to give up something. You're going to give up money. You're going to reduce your position. Because all you have to do is wait for the client. And in your, in your mind, you think the client is going, Man, I'm not going to spend that much money. This person's crazy. How am I going to get out of this room fast enough? More times than not, that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, how can I pull this off? 
How can I, do I really need to ask my wife or can I go ahead and do this or is she gonna be really mad at me? Okay, is that worth it? I kind of think it is. Okay, so you don't know what they're thinking. But if you wait and let them work it out, your chances of having a positive outcome are much, are much greater. Updated for the, the digital age. This one still works. I want you to think about this. There are probably hundreds of thousands of dollars left on the table every year because salespeople can't tolerate silence. If you could take one thing from here, I would say learn to practice sitting in silence with your prospects and your work peers and your family members. Because if you can reserve your speech and let the client speak first, I would, I would be willing to bet that you could make, I'm going to say, at least $5,000 more next year. This one thing. What are some other old school selling techniques? What's that? The what? The puppy? Puppy dog clothes. Yeah, let them take it home. Oh yeah, the free trial. The puppy dog clothes, right? Updated for the digital age. Age free month, right? What are some that have been are not so savory? Anybody? Discounts. Bait and, Bait and switch. So discounts. What do you find unsavory about discounts? Yeah. I mean, a one month free or try it, that I don't disagree with at all, but, well, I don't want to pay that much. Yeah. Oh, okay, then we'll just cut the price in half. Right. And what does that tell the client? That we're worth half as much. That you're worth half as much, and you were overcharging them. And every price is negotiable from here on out. Every hour is worth it. Mm-hmm. And what was the bait and switch? We're going to sell you this but we're going to deliver you this, right? So is that person going to come back to you? Not likely, not likely. They won't refer you. You're not going to get recurring income, and you're basically burning that opportunity, right? So when you are trying to sell, what's, that, what's the voice saying? in your head. Hmm? This is a bad one, but I've got a prize for the brave person. Mm -hmm. What's your, what's your, what's the, uh, what's your brain saying to you? I'm wasting my time. I shouldn't be here. He's not going to buy. I should have gone somewhere else. I should have done more research. He's not going to buy. Yeah, and how true is that? Well, if you assuming you've done your due diligence, uh, mm -hmm. one of our biggest problems is we're prejudging the customer, and you've already said it. We're playing prejudice. But we're we're imposing our values on them without knowing enough about them. Now, yes, and there's a difference between pre-qualifying right. and playing credit manager, right? So you only want to talk to qualified prospects. But once you're there, ask yourself, when you start saying, he's not going to buy, he's not going to do this, he's not going to do that, what's your agenda? Okay? So we want to always be questioning our own motivations. Are you really concerned about his welfare about in this interaction, or are you trying to let yourself off the hook from asking hard questions? Anybody else? Said... Who else says things in their head when they go to closing conversation? Um, there's a fear that they won't close, right? There's the fear of if I don't do this or that, then they, they won't buy. And then I'm, now I'm going to have to find somebody else to buy. That's very interesting. How many people in here have, had, have gone all the way through the sales process and then not asked for the business? Hmm. Mm. What did you do all that for? Yeah. Right? So 
It's a fear of rejection. When you, when you don't ask, you're, you're, what you're saying is, this amount of money is not worth my feelings getting hurt. Right? And if you say that out loud, how do you feel about that? Right? Right? But you have to say it out loud. You have to say, I don't want to sell this $7,000 project because I don't want my feelings to get hurt. But if you say that out loud, you can see how absurd that looks, right? And when you're saying, I'm afraid he won't close if I don't do this, this, and this, but then you do those things and then you still don't ask for the sale, right? Is this a self-worth issue? Right? Please ask me if you can buy my private product. <laughs> right? Do you really believe that you can solve their problem? Or are you setting yourself up on a pedestal and saying, I'm so great, but I'm not really great. I'm pretending. Yeah. Right? One thing that helped me realize they're investing in themselves. Right. Instead of you. Right. In me, right. Absolutely. Can you help them? Because if you can, if, when you start feeling that way and you say, I'm not worthy, and you start saying all those I'm not worthy, flip it back and say, they are worthy of having this problem solved. Right? Because then it's not about you. You're merely serving your client. And a servant is humble, and it doesn't matter if the servant is up here. Right? The servant doesn't have to pretend. The servant only serves, right? Anybody? Anybody else? Yes. 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 Um, so I, that's one of the things I learned from Nathan as my coach is um, it looks like this project is going to be around, um, you know, 22 to 25,000. Um, uh, is that what you were thinking? Um, do you want me to go ahead and write a proposal? I, I learned that verbal yes. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I can take that person and say, look, what you're looking for is probably about a $4,000 website. Yeah. And then we can just have a short conversation and realize that this, let them know that their expectations are low. And I've had them come back and spend that money. Right. Um, but don't be afraid to talk about money. Yes. You're a business person. Business, the purpose of a business is to make money. So nobody's under any illusions that you're there as a volunteer, right? And just because you have a servant heart doesn't mean that you're not going to get paid. And the more you get paid, the more value you can provide to more people, right? And the more they'll treat you like a professional. Absolutely, absolutely. I recently had a gentleman... Um, he came to me and I qualified him and we were, we were at the budget part of the qualification and he said he didn't have the budget for what his project needed. And I said, well, I'd like to introduce you to Shopify and when you're ready for professional design, I would love to talk to you again. No, 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 no. I'm ready and when, when I'm ready, you're the person I want. The takeaway clothes, the take clothes right? But also it's not just a technique. It's because I know my value and my ability to serve him. And if I'm going to serve him at one-third the price, it reduces my ability to serve my other clients and my family. 
because that's who I'm serving most of all. And it is worth noting, since we are talking about money, there are prospects and, and companies that have a budget in mind. If you come in and try to lowball them to get their business, they're going to take you less seriously and think, think less of you. Yes. In fact, I had a conversation with a gentleman last week who was struggling with this, this very thing. He went in, he talked to a furniture uh, retail store, and he came in with a budget of $4,000, and they said, our budget is $20, you are too small, we don't want to deal with you. Right. That person, right? If they don't have the budget, then uh, th that is a solution that they can use. And then they might remember that down the road. When right. You know, they start growing their business and they, or maybe they go through waste and they're just like, oh, oops, you know, maybe this wasn't the right move. And actually, I do need help. And then they can yeah. remember you down the road. And not everybody needs custom design. Not everybody needs to spend their entire operating budget on a website and then they have nothing left over. There's been a lot of businesses go bankrupt that way. And that's also a part of being an ethical provider is knowing to, when to turn a client down. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and what has more credibility? Someone who's going to take every dollar dangled from them or someone who's going to say, no, there's another solution? Yes. So here's my website, and I have this on here because this uh, fear of sales, if you click that button, you can get the slides for this. Um, they're actually one set of slides for WordCamp Atlanta, but they're the same ones. And, um, but you see this Get Started tab? Okay. I have uh, worksheets on there where it says, what's your name? What's your project? Who's your competition? What does success look like to you? What's your budget? You know, that they can fill out before we even have a conversation. Now sometimes I will talk to just about anybody until they tell me to shut up. Um, and that is, that is the truth. So I don't always end a conversation and send them to my worksheet, right? But once I've gotten a feel, because uh, I like to hear people's voice, because you can tell a lot by someone's voice, and there's been quite a few times someone's been on the phone with me and I say, you know what, I can tell right now that I'm not the person to provide the solution to you, but I know somebody who would be a great fit for you and I refer them on, right? But if we are, then I can send them to my worksheet and they get a lot of that and it, it just makes it a better conversation. And also, never let a lead die. Unless that person, you, is a known sociopath, don't let a lead die because one man's trash is another man's treasure. I had a lead come to me and this guy was a hot mess. I mean, anxiety through the roof, nitpicking everything. And I just knew, I mean, just from our first conversation that I, I, just, I was not going to be able to deal with him, right? But I had a friend who loves those type of clients because she's a therapist. And she, can, she knows how to talk them through what they're going through and really work with him to see what his problem is. And they have been together for two years and they're happy as clams. Right? Can you go back now to uh, some of the questions you might ask to uncover the customer's pain points? How do you go about drawing them out with your, with your questions? So I'm a member of WP Elevation and one of the things that they teach in that program is something called go wide and go deep, okay? And so I don't always follow this to the letter, but this is a really great framework. So you say, you know, why, why are you wanting this website? Or why are you wanting this logo? Why else? Why else? 
of these, which is most important. And why is that? And why is that? You know, it's just a framework. I sometimes go in and I was like, tell me about the problems you're having. Are you making as much money as you want to make? What do you think the problem is? Where's the bottleneck, right? And really, I, I approach their business holistically when I go in because they may not need a website. They may need to fire their marketing director, right? They may have a perfectly fine website, but the person doesn't know how to use it, right? So I want, I want to position myself as a digital consultant. That's, that's my business model. So I go in and I'm just like, tell me your story. And then usually if you listen and you're not thinking about how you can leverage what they tell you and you listen, something will pop up and you just, the pain will come up and then you poke it, right? Oh, that's sore. Let's, let's see what's underneath there. Especially if they start, if they get very reactive talking about the last time they dealt with a digital professional. Okay. My ideal client, I'm their third agency. Okay. Because they've grown, they started off with somebody small, then they did something else, and now they've outgrown it, but they've ha they have some ideas about what went wrong along the way, right? And they have some pain. But if you start listening and you start, and you really care about what they're saying, there's going to be some pain, and then you could go, let's talk about that, right? But you have to feel confident in your, and, and you can fake confidence, but you have to at least present a confident demeanor that you care and that you can help them solve that. And you can even say, I might not be the person to solve it, but I can point you in the right direction. And that also solves their problem and lets you off the hook. Plus it builds trust. And it builds trust. Okay. We only have a few more minutes. Anybody else have a question? I just have a comment. Something you mentioned about the confidence discount thing. And I'm the queen of wanting to help everyone. And I got into that for a while. And like I said, your help helps me a lot. But I'm actually here to help you. And what I learned was a technique that um, if someone tells me I can't afford that, then I ask them, well, what can you afford? Like, I can do this for that budget, but I can't do all of this for that budget. So I'll mm. discount, but not, in other words, you're going to get less service. So if you yeah. tell me you can only afford less, then I'll give you less of a service, but I can still help you. Am I less cost-effective? Yeah. Is there a process like that? Yes. Like, well, Right. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever had anybody say they don't know what their budget is? Yeah. I bet they don't. I bet they know what their budget's not. Yeah. Right? Oh, you don't know what your budget is? Is it fifty thousand dollars? No, I was thinking seven. Oh, okay. Well, now we now we've got a conversation. <laughs> oh, okay. She was saying um, about discounting. And this lady said that one of the tactics she uses is to say, well, if, you're, if you can't afford this, what's the number, what is the real number? And let's see what we can do with that, right? Yeah. You don't discount services, you lower the bills. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Some of the most beautiful words in the English language is um, 
That's a great piece for phase two. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it helps us and it helps the client because the client may not can afford that and it helps us to keep scope creep. Right? If somebody keeps adding and adding and adding, and you should always have in your contracts a defined scope, right? But if they're saying, well, I want to do this too, that's fantastic. That'd be great for phase two. Or I can't afford this. Well, let's break it into phase one and phase two. Right. They just don't know what we do in a lot of cases. And we have yes. To educate. Yes, you have to educate them. You have to show them what's in it for them. You have to explain your product because you're the professional and you got that way by building your skill set and you didn't, someone didn't just show up and hand it to you, right? So there's a lot of complexity in that and you have to be able to translate that to them so that they really understand what's happening. Absolutely. Okay, one more question. We're, all done. Anybody? Yeah, real quick, uh, Mr. Gass, um, what are some of your favorite foot in the door strategies? Well, I'm very fortunate that 85% um, of my business comes by referrals. Okay? I do not, that is very intentional. So I spend 20% of my business week in community. Okay? Four days a week I'm running my business hands on. One day a week I'm in community at least. And sometimes it's usually two to three hours a day. So I'm very active in the Atlanta um, WordPress community. I, um, I always uh, try to have lunch with somebody. When I get a check, I'm taking somebody to lunch, right? And that's great for building relationships because guess what? People love lunch, right? And um, so when, if I'm wanting to get in a, a foot in a door, if I'm wanting to meet somebody, I, one of my leads is I was like, I'd love to get to know more about your business and how I can encourage you. Okay. And really that's all I'm wanting is I'm wanting to meet somebody and see how I can encourage them because I don't do cold sales. I mean, I might in the future, but that's just not where I am right now. I just want to meet people that I can encourage, and then usually that develops into a referral at some point. And referrals are warm, they pay you more, they respect you more, right? That's where you want to end up. Now obviously you want inbound as well because you don't want to be completely dependent on someone else's business model or someone else referring you, so you want to have a balance, but referrals are the, where the gold is. Okay, so for um, if you don't live in the Atlanta area and you don't have a nutrient-dense environment for WordPress like we do, I bet you have a Chamber of Commerce. I bet you have a Rotary Club. I bet you have a BNI, right? And what you can do is, um, is you can just go to, those, go to those places and just make connections, one-on-one -on -one connections, right? So, hey, I'd love to know about, more about your business. You want to go grab some coffee? because I want to know what you do. And also, it's good if you want to find out who you can refer to that person, right? Oh, you're a plumber. I'd love to learn more about your business because everybody needs a plumber at some point, right? And if you, if just always turning it back on them, turning it back on them, because then you're not bothering them. In your head, right, all you're doing is you're building relationships. It sounds like you're Framework is oh, that should be everybody's framework. Yeah. Everybody's framework should be what you can do for them. And if you continue to do that, obviously, you're going to want to monetize it appropriately. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, guys. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I'd love to chat with you later. And um, 
please, uh, there, if you want to spend 15 minutes or 30 minutes chatting with me, you can go to bookwithapril.com, and I'd be more than happy to spend some time with you on the phone talking about whatever your sales fears are, because that's what my mission in life is, to help you be able to sell more so you can take better care of your families. Okay.